Let's start our worship today by taking a couple of deep breaths. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Take a minute to feel your feet planted on the ground or on the floor. Take a minute to settle in to your seat or to your walking rhythm or to whatever you are doing right now. Center yourself to open yourself to God's presence as we worship today. today, we are going to use a prayer written by Nadia Boltz Weber called The Lord's Prayer Extended Dance Mix. This was written for this past Sunday. We pray with me? Our Father, our Mother, our Holy Parent, the source of all being from whom we came and to whom we return, you, who knows us better than we know ourselves. Jesus called you Abba, and so shall we, even as we may have an ambiguous relationship with parenthood. Be to us our holy parent, the one who loves without condition. Our Father, who art in heaven. Our Father, who art in everything. Our Father, who art in orphanages and neonatal units and jail cells and luxury high-rises, who art in law offices and homeless shelters and in rooms alone with suicidal people, 
our Father who art in the halls of Congress and the halls of public housing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Ever since the beginning of time, we have mixed up our own sin and ego and wishful thinking and greed and malice and racism and ambition and manipulations of others with you and with your name. And yet, your name remains holy. We print, in God we trust, on the U.S. dollar and then worship that dollar and the power that dollar brings us. And yet, your name remains holy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. God, right now, we beg you to bring more than just a small measure of heaven to earth. Because, God, if you haven't noticed, we are in the middle of a global pandemic and millions are sick and dying, not to mention that the earth is on fire and the election is on Tuesday. It's a mess down here, Lord. So we need your kingdom to speed up. We need wise leaders and just systems and an extra dose of compassion for all of us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy king kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will and not ours be done. Forgive us when we use prayer as a self-help technique by which we can get all the cash and prizes we want out of your divine vending machine if we just kind of bug you to death through ceaseless prayer. Because when it comes down to it, we know better. You are our Father whose name is holy and whose love is boundless and who wants, as our holy parent, to hear our prayers. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread, our daily tortillas, our daily naan, our daily rice. Lord, give us real bread. Even when we keep reaching for those Krispy creams, both the literal ones and the metaphorical ones, give us the gift of real bread and the gift of enoughness. May our response to perceived scarcity always be increased generosity, for we are your children, and from you we receive everything. Give us today our desire for our neighbor to be fed. Give us today our, a desire for a good that is held in common. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us when we hate what you love. Forgive us when we would rather anesthetize ourselves than feel anything at all. Forgive us for how much we resent in others the same things that we hate in ourselves. Forgive us for the terrible things we think about our own bodies bodies that you have made in your image. Forgive us for thinking we know the hearts of our enemies. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the conviction that we do not have evil in our own hearts. Deliver us from religious and national exceptionalism. Deliver us from addiction and depression. Deliver us from self-loathing, from self-righteousness. Deliver us from high fructose corn syrup. Deliver us from a complete lack of imagination about where you are in our lives and how you might be already showing up. Deliver us from complacency. Deliver us from complicity. As Jesus taught us, God, we are throwing this bag of prayers at your door. We're not asking timidly, Lord. 
We are your children and we are claiming your promises as our own today. Some of us are holding your feet to the fire. Some of us don't even know if we believe in you. Some of us are distracted and just going through the motions. Some of us are desperately in love with you, but all of us are your children. Use these prayers, God, to hammer us all into vessels that can accept the answer when it comes. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. And all the children of God say, Amen. When we prayed the Lord's Prayer earlier, we prayed, Give us today our daily bread. And we asked God for the gift of enoughness. And that when we perceive scarcity, that we would have the discipline of generosity. That's why we take a moment each time we worship together to collect offerings so that we can practice the discipline of generosity, so that we can live into the, the discipline of enoughness, that sharing what we have for the good of God's world is a way to live faithful lives and a way to live healthier, more whole lives. I was thinking about calling this segment church chat but I was wondering do you catch the reference to church chat I have a feeling it has something to do with Saturday Night Live but 
Oh. I don't know the reference. That's actually pretty impressive. Yeah. Church Lady, Dana Carvey, Saturday Night Live. Ooh. And her show is called Church Chat. Vintage. Right. Well, I wonder, does anybody else out there even get this reference <laughs> anymore? I think I'm officially aging into the, like, older man category. When you can make vintage SNL references, then you fit into that category. Although you've been there for a long time. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, these, these are lost now, I would say, in a lot of people. Yes. All right, so we're just the two of us, Here pastors of the community, yeah. talking about the Bible. So I think what we'll do is we'll just, we'll just dive right into Scripture today and then talk about what comes up for us in this passage. Sounds great. All right, so this is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is from uh, one of the lectionary text selections for this Sunday. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 9. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We work night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was towards you believers. As you know, we dealt with each, of, each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you should lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers. So for me, when I read this, there was a verse right in the middle that, that stuck out to me. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was towards you believers. As you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children. And here, here it is. Here's what I, I really was focusing on. Urging and encouraging you and pleading that you should lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. It feels really... I don't know if lofty is the right word, but I feel a lot of pressure. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> I feel a lot of pressure when I hear that. And, and what I realized is that I've got some baggage hmm. when it comes to that. Um, my dad was a pastor. Your dad was a pastor. Yeah. And because of the way that I saw people treat him and change around him, I never wanted to be a pastor. Hmm. Because whether or not it was true, people put him on a pedestal. They, they thought of him as like the holy man, more, more pure. And meanwhile, I was at home, one of his kids who got the brunt of his flaws, you know, his impatience. And so I would get really mad when people would lift him up mm -hmm. as this, this like holier than thou person. And, and I don't think he did that to himself, but... You could sense it. I could sense community. it. Yeah. And so I always wanted to avoid that. And I think I came into ministry... When I finally kind of submitted to this call that God has placed on my life, actively trying to avoid that, hmm. not wanting to be put on a pedestal, constantly reminding people, no, you're probably better than I am when it comes to leading a holy life. So I think that was more of an immature way of handling it. But, but still, I get really uh, hesitant about the piousness hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. What about you? You're a pastor's kid. Yeah, similar. I remember my dad saying one time that, um, tongue in, in tongue in cheek, but he said, um, boy, when people find out I'm a pastor, they don't want to touch me with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> um, yeah, there was definitely a pedestal. Uh, and I think part of that was generational. Um, I don't sense that quite as much anymore. Um, but, you know, my parents never, never said to me, like, you have to be good because what will people think? Mm -hmm. um, my parents never said that to me, but I, I definitely know um, preachers' kids and other, other parents who, who put that pressure on their children, like, what will people think? Um, and, yeah, it does feel like a, a really immature kind of approach to, um, to faith, uh, and being a Christian on the one hand, and then like the pushing back on that and being like, no, I'm just like everybody else is like going, a, you know, you go in, on the ditch in one side or on the other. And so I wonder what this, you know, we've been kind of working on living in this more middle way of maturity. And so I'm curious about how you think about that now with all the work that you've done um, to kind of 
become emotionally and spiritually mature. Mm -hmm. So, so what is this imagery of being pure and upright and blameless and leading a life worthy of God? What does that bring up for you now? Well, it's funny as I think about it now, especially as I see a lot of people acting out, um, I almost think about it as like just being a decent person in general. <laughs> like, I think, I think for me now the bar is so much lower than when I initially read a passage oh. like this. Hmm. And yes, I think God does set the bar really high for us, but, but honestly, I think with, with our political climate, with the way that I see people talk about each other on social media, um, or in the news, um, it, it seems like the bar is set so low for us to be more decent mm -hmm. to each other. And so for me, it really just causes me to think about everyday life. How is it that I treat somebody who frustrates me? Mm -hmm. how, how is it that I show up in the world? Um, you know, especially as I've started working for the RCA as well, and so I deal um, with people in their retirement accounts. Yeah. Right, there's a lot on the line there, and so I, I get to witness that on the customer service end, there's a lot of people who kind of call up or write emails guns a-blazing, uh -huh. and I see how ineffective that is. Mm -hmm. in, you know, we, we treat everybody the same, and we, we try to help everybody, and yet it's so much easier when somebody approaches you from a, a place of curiosity uh -huh. and understanding rather than... You, you, are, you are out to get me, yeah. rather than viewing us as, as adversarial. And that's been really helpful for me in my development too. Um, in the Ritter world, we talk about being curious mm -hmm. rather than um, letting anxiety get the best of us. Mm -hmm. And even when I read, uh, I read a book by Urban Meyer, Ohio State's football, former football coach, <laughs> and, and he had this phrase that felt like it came right out of our, our Ritter church renewal process. He said, don't get, cu don't get furious, get curious. Ah. And I love that phrase because, again, it's, it's approaching somebody believing that they're loved by God, yeah. believing that they've got something to say, and, and you might never perfectly agree with them, mm -hmm. um, but to just write somebody off as completely bad or completely good, that starts getting us in these like stances where we're at each other. What do you think about that? Well, what, what you just said... Um, reminds reminds me of the way of Christ, obviously. Um, that that way of being curious and refusing to be in an adversarial adversarial relationship with people, even with even with enemies. Now now he Jesus wasn't wasn't slow to point out when he when people were wrong in his eyes or when they when they um when they were harming others he would not hesitate to point that out but he would do it in such a way that honored their humanity and that um assumed that they that they could be partners and that um there was something worthy in them of connection and that's the way Jesus approached people and um that's that makes all of the difference in, again, in this political climate where the bar is set so low. Um, we're led, we're called to lead a life that's worthy of, worthy of God. And maybe that's a lot more like mundane and every day mm -hmm. than the sort of pious, um, pie in the sky perfection that I, that I used to have in my mind as a kid. You know, this is just every day, listening to people, um, not being a jerk, like in your sermon last week, um, and just trying to um, build those connections and honor the humanity in one another. How have you evolved in this from a kid to present day? Mm -hmm. I think uh, for, for me to lead a life worthy of God, um, has a lot more to do with with joy and delight now than it did before. Um, I think before before in my younger days that that calling to lead a life worthy of God felt like you know constantly having to 
crush my own will and do what God wanted and always like struggling to try to figure out what God wants me to do and it was always going to be hard and I was always going to be going against the grain of society and I'm realizing um, that phrase, oh I forget who said it, but it was an early an early church father who said the, the main point of Christian life is to enjoy God and to serve God forever, to enjoy God. And that to me has a lot more, um, a lot more pull these days. And what is it that gives me joy? And that that is a gift of God. And that living into that actually contributes to the kind of world that God wants, wants to build uh, is when I want, when I am in touch with the joy of my own life and receiving filling up with joy from creation and from connections with other people. That contributes to the kind of world that God wants to build. Uh, that mentions after that, God calls us into God's kingdom and glory. And that's the life that builds God's kingdom, not like blind and bitter obedience, but living into joy. Yeah. And when I think of the blind and bitter obedience, I think of very rigid you know, Christian faith traditions, and especially one where you've got kids who have grown up reading catechisms, doing Bible studies, and often when I think about living a life that's described in this passage, I think of sort of this this rigid structure that takes years and years and years to develop. But then I was, as I was reading about the Thessalonians, I realized this is a very, very young Christian community. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in age, but they, they were pagans before this. Yeah. They're just introduced to the concept. And they're so, brand new baby Christians. Yeah, they're being called to this life, not after years and years and years of preparation, but mm-hmm. like right now, where they are. Yeah. So how do you think that's comparable to you know, our community? Um, maybe not necessarily as a church, but maybe as a, it could be our church, but maybe even as a greater Christian community in the United States. You know, I think, I think we're in... I think we're in some kind of new awakening of what it means to be Christians. Um, Seeing a lot of ways of being church and um, that have gotten really mixed up with political power and with whiteness and with toxic masculinity. Um, I think the church, I think there's so becoming what it means to be a Christian feels really new to me right now Um, and so that's really exciting like the feeling of of starting starting fresh and um, kind of pushing away some of that old baggage that doesn't fit anymore with this calling of Christ Um, and this is just a simple reminder simple reminder to lead a life worthy of God and I think that flows naturally if you, um, if you are, when I, I'll speak personally, when I am um, in touch with, with, uh, with Christ and when I am living uh, in such a way that I feel that joy and connection and um, not j- empty happiness, but deep joy, then it, it's a lot more obvious to me, like what the what the way forward is to live a life worthy of God. Um, so kind of coming back to the basics, I think. Yeah. I really liked what you said, too, about, I don't know if this was the word you used, but the unraveling of a lot of the ways that we had connected mm-hmm. faith with um, patriotism mm-hmm. and, and, and other areas like that. And that's exciting to me, too. Because, again, I think we've created these false dichotomies to say, like, yeah, to be a good Christian is to, you know, have a certain sense of patriotism, and um, rather than saying like, no, you don't have to be patriotic to be a Christian. What I what I want to embrace is, I would love to live a life worthy of God, while still um, being proud of being a United States citizen and the journey that the U.S. is on. But those two things don't necessarily always have to go together. Yeah. Um, they they play together. They influence each other, and yet they're not like they're not connected mm-hmm. as, as much. Like, so I was driving through Pennsylvania recently and there was this big red barn that had a huge mural painted on it, huge mural. And it was a tank driving with Donald Trump sticking out of the tank, holding a Bible and uh, a machine gun. Wow. And it was, yes, it was a stunning image. Oh, um, wow. 
But what, what we've often done is associated political parties with faith groups. Mm -hmm. and, and that has just made me sick because I want to participate in political life. I want to participate in religious life. And to say that there's ways of like being a Christian and, and this form of political presence, I'm, I'm just done with that. Mm -hmm. I'm so done with that. And I want, to, I want to be able to put God first. I think that's the roundabout thing that I'm getting yeah. at here. I want to be able to say, I'm a citizen of God's kingdom first and foremost. Doesn't mean I love being an American any less, but mm -hmm. that's my priority. And I think before I had to be sheepish about admitting that, but now I can just say, like, no, that, that's what God calls me to, and that's what's going to be most important. Yeah, so, so what you just said makes me think of that movement from the either or uh, to the both and. And so now the both and, like, we've, we've gotten, our culture is terrible at this. We're either, we're either like versus, you know, like us versus them, or we have to be completely in agreement on every little detail. Fused together. Fused, that's the word. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so, and, but what, what Christ calls us to is holding both of those things, being fully um, a citizen of God's kingdom and living in a way that builds God's kingdom and also like recognizing that we do this in a very specific context of here in the United States in this political climate uh, and we, we can do both and we can um, hold those convictions of our Christian faith mm -hmm. and also um, be good citizens of our country and, and all that that means and requires of us. All right, so getting down to the super personal level, what is one thing that you will take away from this passage and try to apply in your life this coming week? Mm, good question. Um, I want to go back a, a verse from where you've been, where we've been focusing. Um, Paul says, as you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children. Um, there's such a fondness here and it comes through if you read more in the in the book of first Thess Thessalonians uh, there's such a fondness between Paul and his, and the people that he's writing yeah, to it says and it also says like like a nursing mother just a couple of verses oh, earlier does it yeah. I didn't see that that's so yeah. cool um, there's a fondness and, a, and an intimacy there um, and that's that's what he's talking to them out of that's what he is encouraging them to live this way out of. And I think, you know, I just had a, a conversation with one of the elders in our church. You know, they're all divided. Our elders each have a care list of people, elders and deacons from the congregation. And um, this elder is pretty new here and wanted to talk with me about the people on her care list and how, how she can support them. Um, and as I was walk talking with her about the people on her list, I just felt this incredible fondness uh, fondness for for the people in this congregation and I think that's you know living a life worthy of God is such a gift when we do it together and God can give us this gift of fondness uh, to go to go along with that and I think that is one of the things that can build that kingdom um, and that's not to say that those relationships are all simple or you know that I um, and blind to some of the trickier things in some of those relationships, but that there's this gift of love and belonging that goes that goes along with this, and that we're in it together. Wow. Yeah. What about for you? I think for me, um, I'm going to try to to notice when I'm getting anxious, especially with other people, and and try to slow myself down a bit and remind myself that the way that I act or respond towards this person is essentially a witness of God. Mm. Like they, they will, because, especially because I'm a pastor, I mean, yeah. it might not be true for everybody that they'll immediately be associated with their faith, but certainly for me, um, and, I, and I hope for everybody that's watching too, you, you take this into consideration that the way we respond is, is a witness to God. And I think just slowing myself down and having that quick reminder will allow me to interact and respond with, with more compassion and again, like what you were saying, um, having a sense of love for the person, realizing that God loves them and, and 
even the most frustrating people to try to find some place to say like, God loves them, just show them a little bit of care and see what happens. It's a great reminder this week. I'm aware that there's huge anxiety in our country this week with the election and rising coronavirus numbers. There's a huge amount of anxiety and it gets really easy to be reactive and cranky and um, assume the worst and that feels like that feels really instructive to me to slow down um, so I'm going to take that with me this week too to slow down and um, look for that humanity all right we have to keep each other accountable okay you know <laughs> I love that <laughs> yeah sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining me for church chat, or I guess we're joining each other. For I church guess chat. we are, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's do rock, paper, scissors to see who has to close All our right. prayer. Best out of three? No, just one. Just one? Oh, yes. man. Okay. Stakes are high. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, okay. Yes. Ah, Wait. Uh, so who has to pray now? I won. Who has to pray? I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, that your word becomes alive in our hearts. This is not uh, an ancient document with dead words in it, but words that still live and breathe to this day, words that we need to hear. So God, please bless not only the two of us, but everybody else who hears and engages in this discussion. Help us to be a witness to you in this world, not in an out of reach, uh, over pious way, but, but in a real down to earth way where in our interactions with each other, even the hardest people in, in, our, in our lives, may we be a witness to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Every day We go to war again We assume We know so much more than that they have to say Headline breaks And we start to hate again We're Calling them names again We give our peace away I hope they see it Cause I wanna see Hope we believe in. I want to see, I want to see the love all around you, all around you. I want to know, I want to know that love is all.
lights you are See how it lights you up It lights you up I wanna see, I wanna see the love Friends, as you go from here to whatever is next for you, go with God's blessing. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>